I've invited people who uh, propose free sex, others who propose paid sex, and still others who propose no sex at all. Uh, to get us started, but really I hope, especially the people in the peanut gallery have paid attention to the advisory. Okay, everybody who's staying is calm, mature, adult, will not be offended, because I can't predict exactly what will be said. We're going to begin, if you'll pardon the pun, with a deep dive into a portrait of human desire. Two more neuroscientists who, without any preconceptions, decided to pursue a controversial research program and follow, they say, the data wherever it leads. And it leads to some very interesting results. Uh, both of them, we're talking about Ogi Ogas and Sai Gadam, are heterosexual males. Ogi is 40 and half Latino. Sai is 31 and all Indian. Most of their findings, well, I think they're kind of going to be logical, but one or two um, will be reassuring to some. Somebody gave me a pun. Do I dare? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Well, um, it turns out that men, deep down, like a cushion for the pushing. <laughs> Ogi, <laughs> sorry. So we're going to talk to you about our research, and you're very lucky because we can't even talk about our research with our own families. My grandmother thinks I'm up here giving a lecture on color vision. So today we're going to answer a question about sexual desire that you probably never asked with an explanation that you probably never imagined. But it's a question that gets to the very heart of the difference between the male sexual brain and the female sexual brain. Here's the question. What does women's erotic interest in Edward Cullen, the fictional vampire from the Twilight novels, have in common with men's erotic interest in shemale porn. Yes, folks, we're going to be talking about shemale porn. <laughs> so, the explanation of human sexual diversity has been one of the greatest challenges in the history of science. The science of sex was founded in 1886 in Germany, and coincidentally, in the same year in Germany, another important scientific discipline was founded, radiophysics. And it's instructive to compare the progress of radiophysics and sexology over the subsequent century and a half. And we might ask, what have radiophysicists accomplished over the past 130 years? Well, they've invented the DVD, they've created machines that can scan our brains, they've even listened to the sounds of the Big Bang, the origins of the known universe. What about sex scientists? What have they achieved? Well, the sad fact of the matter is they're still asking almost the exact same questions that were being asked back in the 19th century. Where does homosexuality come from? What is the purpose of female orgasm? And which sexual interests are natural and healthy, and which ones are deviant? And the reason there's been such little progress in the science of sex is because it's been very hard to know what men and women truly like. There just hasn't been a good way to get accurate data on men and women's true sexual interests. But we're blessed to live in a revolutionary time for the science of sex, because for the first time in human history, we can get accurate information about men and women's true secret desires with a miraculous new technology, and that technology, of course, is the Internet. So we put together the largest sexual data set ever assembled. We analyzed a billion web searches, half a million search histories, a million erotic stories, a million erotic videos, millions of online personal ads, the million most popular websites on the internet, and much more. We like to call this the digital footprints of humanity. Here's one such set of footprints, the search history of an anonymous user on America Online. So, for our research, 
for our research, we combined this massive untapped set of online sexual data with neuroscience, animal studies, psychology research to come up with a new and comprehensive understanding of sexual desire, and in particular, an explanation of, what men, of why men and women like the things they do. And men and, men and women certainly like a tremendous diversity of things. So I'm going to show you a list of searches made during a single hour on a search engine from our online data set, made by different people. And as you can see, it's extremely diverse. In fact, our natural reaction when confronted with such sexual diversity is to think, how can there possibly be a simple explanation for this? Surely most of this must be due to the vagaries of culture. There can't be some simple biological explanation. But consider the food that we eat. Human beings like a tremendous variety of food. Oysters, zucchini, anchovies, Big Macs, Oreo cheesecake. Here in Toronto, they eat poutine, which I tried last night, and I can tell you it is the shemale porn of international cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> so, yet all of the diversity of the food that we eat can be reduced to five universal taste cues. Sweet, salty, sour, savory, and bitter. All of the food that we eat is made up of different combinations of these taste cues. So even though it seems very diverse, our cuisine can be reduced to these fundamental constituents, and it turns out our sexual desires operate the same way. Our sexual taste can be reduced to a finite set of sexual cues. But I'll tell you one of the most fundamental facts about human desire, and that is that male sexual cues are very different from female sexual cues. So, <laughs> so what do men like to do when they go online? Well, that's a very, very easy answer. Men like to look at porn. Over 100 million men in North America view online porn each year. About 75% of men visit porn sites each month. Male sexual cues are primarily visual, no surprise there. And one thing men like to look at are body parts. So one thing we did in our research is we wanted to figure out which body parts are universal in terms of male sexual interest. That is, are there some body parts that the male sexual brain has a biological predisposition to focusing on? And to somewhat of our surprise, it turns out there are four body parts that men in every country in the world are interested in looking at. And they are chests. Breasts are the third most popular genre of adult websites on the internet, and the fourth most common sexual search. Buttocks. The 21st most common sexual search. Feet. The 54th most common sexual search. Any, anybody want to guess what the fourth one is? <laughs> the penis. <laughs> Penises are, in fact, the seventh most common sexual search on the internet. Men like to search for penises almost as often as they search for vaginas. In our sexual search data set, there were 1.1 million uh, searches for, excuse the term, for the word pussy, and about 0.94 million uh, searches for the word dick. So we can get an idea of exactly what men are looking for with penises by looking at individual search histories, and here is one of them. Men are especially interested Men are especially interested in looking at large penises. Of the 42,000 most popular adult websites on the internet, there are 1,072 devoted to large penises and three to small ones. <laughs> <laughs> so why are men so interested in looking at penises? Well, there's a few explanations. I'm going to talk about two of the most plausible biological explanations. First, it may be due to the evolutionary heritage from our primate ancestors. Across primates, the penis is a prominent and versatile social tool. Males use the penis to indicate aggression, to mark territory, to indicate dominance, to indicate sexual interests. Male monkeys and male apes monitor other males' penises as a valuable source of social information. But there's another reason uh, that biologists call uh, sperm competition adaptation. Sperm competition adaptation. This is found all across the animal kingdom, especially among mammals, and it exists because when a male 
sees another male copulating with a female, if the first male wants a chance to outreproduce the other male, to impregnate that female, he needs to have more sexual arousal and have, pursue her with greater sexual vigor than the second male. So, for example, uh, there's a physical example of a sperm competition adaptation in the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee has enormous testicles, and that's because male chimpanzees are very promiscuous, and if they want to have a chance of outcompeting other male other men who have other males who have just had sex with a female chimp, they need to produce copious amounts of sperm to blast out the first male sperm. It gives a new meaning to the term "sloppy seconds." <laughs> Another example of a physical sperm adaptation is found in the human male: the shape of the penis. The human penis is shaped like a shovel. It's designed to shovel out other men's sperm. This is, in fact, why men go flaccid after they ejaculate, is to prevent them from inadvertently shoveling out their own sperm. So these are two plausible biological explanations. Oh,、uh, biologists, of course, have suggested that the sight of an erect, large penis in the proximity of a female is most likely a sperm competition cue that triggers arousal. There's actually a number of sperm competition cues that trigger arousal, but、uh, it's believed that,、uh, that this is most likely.、Uh, Uh, a very strong reason. There's even been studies that where they presented men、uh, with visuals of penises, and they were more aroused by the sight of a large penis、uh, when there was a female around it. So again, suggesting that it's a sperm competition cue. Well, one thing's very clear from our data, and that is men are far, far more interested in looking at penises than women are. <laughs> <laughs> We also analyzed the content of 10,000 digitized romance novels. Uh, including many erotic novels, and we compile a list of the hundred most common words, the most frequent words used to describe the hero's physical attributes. The penis is not on this list. So women are not very interested in looking at pornography. Well, about one in three women, a minority, do watch online porn. The vast majority of Playgirl magazine's 400,000 subscribers are actually gay men. Female sexual cues. Are primarily psychological. That's why women prefer stories. In fact, the most popular erotic artifact for women in the world is the romance novel. Over 68 million women in North America purchase romance novels each year. But on the internet, there has been an explosion of another kind of female story, of females' literature, and that's called fan fiction. Fan fiction are amateur stories. Written about popular characters from TV shows and movies and books. For example, some of the most popular fan fiction is Harry Potter, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Lord of the Rings, and Twilight. And one very common kind of fan fiction story from Twilight are stories about Edward Cullen, the vampire, and Jacob Black, the werewolf, falling in love and having sex. A very typical kind of fan fiction story. The single most popular erotic website on the internet for women is fanfiction.net. It receives about 600,000 visitors a day and has more than two million stories, fan fiction stories. The most popular erotic novel for women in the past decade, which is currently right now burning up the bestseller charts, is Fifty Shades of Grey, which started out as Twilight fan fiction. So we analyzed a huge body of women's erotic stories and romantic stories to try to discern what are the cues, the universal cues that seem to arouse women in every country in the world. And I'm going to talk about four of them. Our first question was, what kind of men are women interested in? The psychologists Marianne Fisher and Tammy Meredith analyzed the titles of 15,000 romance novels and compiled a list of the most frequent professions of the heroes. Here's the top ten most common hero professions. You'll be hard pressed to find a romance hero who's a plumber, <laughs> an accountant, an insurance salesman. But this is only half the story. Women want their men to be like coconuts, hard and tough on the outside, but soft and sweet on the inside. The, the vast majority of、uh, romance heroes have a tormented past, or are fighting inner demons, or have a dark history, and it's up to the heroine to help the alpha male hero get in touch. With his emotional side and heal his emotions, and eventually declare his love for the heroine. This is the predominant narrative that we find across all romance and erotic stories for women: an alpha male hero who gradually gets in touch with his emotional side 
and declares his undying love for the heroine. Another kind of uh, female psychological cue are contextual cues, and one in particular is the popularity cue. So this is very different from the way men operate. Women care about the opinion of other women when evaluating the attractiveness of a man. The more women that find a man attractive, the more appealing he seems to a woman. This is the source of the phrase, the best men are always taken. The best men are always taken because a taken man is inherently a better man. And a fourth cue is an internal cue. Most male cues are external, aimed at the woman, visual cues. But women are also aroused by internal cues. Men aren't aroused by internal cues. One example is what we call the irresistibility cue. A famous female author once wrote, the desire of the man is for the woman. The desire of the woman is for the desire of the man. A majority of women, studies have found, have sexual fantasies about being the center of sexual attention, about being a stripper or a harem girl or a belly dancer, are being desired by many men. Very common erotic fantasy, it's the irresistibility cue. So uh, we've reviewed four psychological cues of women, four visual cues of men, and the range of these psychological and visual cues forms the basis for all of our sexual desire. But, hold on, you're probably wondering, what about Edward Cullen and the shemale porn? Are we saying that the female sexual brain comes wired to be turned on by fictional vampires and the male sexual brain is wired to be turned on by shemales? No, we need a little more explanation. We need to explain how the brain processes sexual cues. And to do that, we're going to turn to another brain system, the visual system, and consider optical illusions. Here's the most famous optical illusion in art history, the bewitching and enigmatic Mona Lisa smile. The Mona Lisa actually combines two distinct visual stimuli. What you see here is a high-resolution image to the left and a low-resolution image to the right. The smile only exists in the low-resolution image. So our brain puts these visual stimuli together and creates the perception, the illusion of this bewitching, enigmatic smile. Leonardo da Vinci painted an optical illusion. In the same way that the juxtaposition of two different visual stimuli can trick the visual brain into producing an optical illusion, it's possible for two different sexual cues to trick the sexual brain into producing an erotical illusion. And since male sexual brains and female sexual brains are so different, we'd expect male erotical illusions to be different from female erotical illusions, and that's indeed what we find. A great example of a male erotical illusion is shemale porn. Now, you might be surprised to hear that shemale porn is actually one of the most popular genres of pornography all across the planet, one of the top 10 most popular genres of porn for heterosexual men. Heterosexual men form the main audience for shemale porn, and we can look at different examples of shemale porn to get a sense of what men find attractive about this, they're attracted to young women, large breasts, rounds butt, small feet, and large penises. In other words, a juxtaposition of the different visual cues. In fact, if you talk to men that are fans of female porn, they usually say something like, she's beautiful, but then there's something else that pops out of my brain, it's beguiling, it's strange, I can't really explain it, which is exactly how people describe optical illusions. But if this is true, we should expect that this should not affect the female brain. So let's consider Buck Angel, who actually spoke here at Idea City two years ago. Very attractive man, big muscles, tats, a beard, a cigar, and a vagina. Do women <laughs> find this visual image attractive? No, most women do not. But there is an audience that finds the images of Buck Angel to be very appealing, very sexually intriguing, and that audience is gay men. So Buck Angel is also a male erotical illusion, what about female radical illusions? Well, you probably guessed by now, Edward Cullen is a female radical illusion. He combines a variety, a wide variety of different female psychological cues into a single concoction. For example, Edward Cullen has the body of a sexy young teenager, but the confident, mature, experienced mind of a hundred-year-old man because vampires live a very long time without aging. <laughs> is he an alpha male? He is a super alpha male. Because he's super strong and super fast, he can defend his girlfriend, Bella, from all kinds of human bullies and even some supernatural ones. What about the irresistibility cue? Well, Edward Cullen has perpetual lust for Bella. He, he infinitely hungers for her, for her blood. Because he's a vampire, he has this endless lust. He wants to drink her blood, but at the same time, he shows his emotional side. He shows his love to her by never consummating, never giving in to this urge.
And finally, uh, popularity cue. All the girls in the high school where Edward and Bella go to school, they all have crushes on Edward. They all want to go out with him, but he only has eyes for Bella. And a nose. <laughs> so, <laughs> Edward Cullen and Shemel porn are erotical illusions, and this is one of the fundamental bases for how our sexual desire operates. And in conclusion, let me say sometimes our science is criticized for being too reductionist, for oversimplifying human sexual desire. But truly, we take the opposite philosophy. We think this shows the incredible creativity and imagination of our sexual brain. These simple sexual cues can produce such original creations as a fictional vampire in a whole series of novels and shemale schoolgirls. These are just so inventive and it shows us no limit to our potential of our human sexual creativity. And it also suggests that we should be more tolerant and understanding and not feel so much guilt and shame about our own sexual interests and our partner's sexual interests Sexual interests are natural and healthy, even when they might seem very strange. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Oh, pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you know, in the vein of these uh, drugs, if I may, uh, one argument is that it's a gateway to something worse. Did, did you guys feel that you were taking any risks by immersing yourself in a million porn sites and... Well, we had no idea what to expect, so as part of our research, we made sure we ourselves looked at all the pornography and read the erotic stories, <laughs> anything that we wrote about, and that was definitely a bit uh, unsettling uh, and even gross at times, but uh, we came out with the exact same sexual interests we had at the beginning of our ah, research. you see, that was going to be my second yes. question. Did as, as it have any impact on your level of appetite? As two straight guys, we also had to watch gay porn, and we got a sense of how women react to it, react to straight porn when they see it. It was quite unsettling, but also enlightening as to what it actually is. It's ultimately two bodies in a tangle. The, fir the first time we watched gay porn, we were like, oh, it's too graphic, it's too gross, you know, it's too visual, which is exactly how women describe straight porn most of the time. So. And last question, I'm sure it's on everyone's mind. Are you guys in relationships? <laughs> yes. yes, separately. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your partners think of your research project? Uh, they, they understand it's science. They are doing uh, serious research. So, <laughs> and I think that's I the think line, guys. <laughs> It's science. It's, a, it's also appealing to go out with an international sex expert. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.